Okay, today is October the 11th, 2007. I'm in Oklahoma City at the Capitol with Susan Winchester, who was elected to the House of Representatives in 1998. And my name is Tanya Fincham, and I'm with the Oklahoma State University Library, and we're doing an oral history project entitled Women of the Oklahoma Legislature. So thank you for having me today. Thank you. Okay, let's start by having you tell us a little bit about your childhood. My childhood. I was born in Chickasha. Oh, you're a native. I'm a native. Uh -huh. Grew up there. Graduated from high school. Um, grew up on the farm, lived on the farm until I was 11, and then moved to Main Street, which was an experience in and of itself, very different, but we kept the farms and everything. So I always say I, I'm a farmer at heart, a rancher, really, rather than a, than a city person. And uh, where did you attend college? Um, University of Oklahoma. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not very far from home. In fact, I came home in the afternoons and worked. <laughs> so I worked for the family. So. How many brothers and sisters? I have two sisters. Older, younger? Younger. Mm -hmm. and have any of them gone into politics? No. Okay. No. Uh, one is no longer living. The other is in the oil business okay. in, in Texas. Well, what got you interested in the political arena? Um... My grandfather was a state senator from Colorado, and being there at Christmas or on the holidays, he would have all kind of, uh, talked about history and political events constantly, would have all kinds of Christmas cards from like the president, and I was so impressed. I know now that everybody gets them, but I didn't know that at the time. But I mean, he was just a very strong influence in the, in the overall political arena. I also had a, a great aunt that I spent a tremendous amount of time with who was very much into local politics. Not elected, but she worked at the election board, worked on the po polling on election days, um, actively involved in all of the local elections, did phone calls, did all kinds of polling, and those it, very different then than it is now, but very grassroots. But she was actively, actively involved. And one of my most favorite stories called and you had to be 21 to register when I first registered and said come home I was at school I came home and she said you know it's happy birthday time I have you your angel food cake and we're going to go register and we went to register and I registered as a Republican much to her horror <laughs> and she, you know, she sat in the car like this all the way back home and she said you know you'll never get to vote you'll never get to vote and I never got to vote in a local election until two years ago so long time uh, well, did you, what did you do before you got into politics? Let's go that um, I had an aerial spraying business until I was 38. My family did, and then I, I bought part of it at one time and ran that in, until 1988, 89, sold it in 89. I also have a master's degree in human relations and an education background. I, I worked part-time at the Career Tech in Chickasha. Aerial spraying is seasonal, so you had the time to teach part-time. I taught some of the night classes. They offered um, me an opportunity, a job, <laughs> to put together a beginning business and office program. And I did that for two years and then was hired as the adult uh, coordinator and developer. Worked in the business services part of the, of the career tech. The aerial spray is dust cropping? Mm -hmm. Crop were, dusting. Uh -huh. Were there very yes. many women in that business? No. <laughs> One of the few. One of the few. And uh, I, I, I've said my very first real job was driving a chemical truck. <laughs> so. Well, did you actually fly the plane? No, I didn't. Fly, I have a pilot's license, but I didn't fly. Exactly. No, we had commercial exactly. pilots that, that do that. That's, that's interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, um, tell me a little bit about the events leading up to your decision to run. It was, um, just through interest, I you know I'd helped other people run, raise money for them, held fundraisers, you know, licked envelopes, put on stamps, put out yard signs, everything like that. Um, in '97, my husband was appointed as a federal administrative law judge, and assigned to New Orleans. Unfortunately, with all of child welfare acts, that's where they needed people, and that's where he was sent. And I was homesick and going back and forth and called a friend of mine at home. Before we left, I'd done a fundraiser for Mary Fallon, and I'd, done, I'd helped with one for Governor Keating. And the state rep was coming up, and I called to see what I could do to help him. 
and he, they said, well, let me think about it. I'll call you back. And he called back and he said, come home and run in my place. I'm not going to run again. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> was, did you have someone running against you? Um, uh, someone that I, I say was a 12-year incumbent. He really wasn't. He'd been defeated by two by someone. There'd been two other people in office, but then he came back and ran. So, it, I mean, I felt like I was running against someone who, and, and what, someone that was obviously experienced, had a lot of opportunity in office, and was very up on the issues, what was going on, so. Who was your campaign manager? Did you have one? I didn't really have one. I mean, it was family effort, friends effort. Um, you know, when you first run, you don't really know that you have to have all of those things. My predecessor was really my, probably the campaign manager. I don't think we actually okay. gave him that title, or he didn't take that title, but very, very helpful in helping me put the campaign together, introducing me to people, making sure I did all those things that, that he knew at that point that I needed to do. Do you have a slogan? Mm, I, she gets the job done, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I need to send you some of my early campaign materials. <laughs> and what about the second time? Um, the second time I had, I mean, when you campaign that intensely, and we did the first time, because it's, you know, I'm, I was in the minority as far as party registration. Very, very hard to overcome the numbers, but we have um, at least enough swing voters in my district to to have made that happen. The, and you, know, you think, I campaigned so hard and it just happened yesterday, no one surely would run, but someone did from one of the smaller communities in my district. And, you know, I was scared to death and ran just as hard the second time as I had the first, and won with, um, I think, 68% of the vote, so. And we decided in my district there's 32% that you never get anyway. <laughs> so I, I, was, I felt very good about having one with, with that particular margin. You knocked on a lot of doors, or did you have a different uh, strategy? Knocked on a lot of doors, yeah. We, uh, we do a lot of direct mail. Direct mail, I think, is the most effective because it actually, as I've been told, it gets into someone's hands. They may or may not throw it away. If it lays around, they play with it, look at it again. So you have more opportunities than than a phone call or newspaper, I think, is the least effective. Any favorite campaign stories? The one, but I don't want it on tape. I'll tell you after you quit doing this. Okay. Some of the issues, uh, I, I know I had one man up in the, the Bridge Creek area, that a farmer that came up and he said, what do you think of kids and farms or people and farms? And I go, well, you know, my, my background's farming and ranching and I like farms and I like kids and and he was actually saying firearms <laughs> not farms so as soon as it clicked what you know, what direction we were really going we got on the right track but I mean you I think the best part of a campaign is the the people that you meet and the opportunity to meet so many people that that you'll be representing and to hear firsthand what their concerns are because you know, having been here I know a lot of the things that we worry about and spend so much time working on are really not that relevant to the everyday person in your district. They are, they, they are important, but they're not as significant as, as we sometimes think they are. Well, what about the night of the election? Oh, the, the first election was the best after that. It's kind of ho-hum. No one got really <laughs> excited. But we had you know, all the volunteers. I have, a, fortunately, a great big house in Chickasha, and it was full, and everyone was excited, and it was very... The numbers were very, very close. I lost in Chickasha, which was very humiliating. I said, I'd grown up here. My opponent was a transplant from Colorado and had, I mean, very well known, very well thought of. So that's not fair, but it's like, you know, you're mine first. But I, I lost in Chickasha, but carried the northern end of the district by enough votes that I think I won 56% of the of the vote the first time. So. Do you know if a lot of women came out to vote for you? or? I hope so. We had trouble, and, and that was real surprising to me. Republican women don't always think that a woman should be in office, which, I mean, and they would tell me. Because I, I had a young child. I needed to stay home with my baby, and so my, you know, my baby can come to work with me, <laughs> <laughs> and he has, so. And it was interesting, but I, you know, I had a lot of men say they would vote for me because I w was a woman, and they felt they could trust me and what I was saying far more than they could a man. But I had tremendous, tremendous female support, particularly in Chickasha. We did phone banks and we did 
you know, a lot of mailings. Everyone came out and wanted to help. And, that, you know, that's, that's very rewarding to see that. All about the day you were sworn in. Um, all my family came. <laughs> and I, you know, I didn't know you had to introduce them from the gallery. And with you know, last name being, you know, starting with a W, you get to wait until everybody else has gone around. But it was exciting. It's, it's been, it, it was fun to be able to thank everybody and to know that your family was there and supportive. And then do you remember the first bill you presented on the floor or a debate, whatever? Um, I remember the second one. Yeah, I, I remember the, fir the first one was a tax credit for the Oklahoma City National Memorial. And we had, um, oh, got into a sparring war with the chairman of the tax committee because they were passing tax credits for chicken manure in eastern Oklahoma and he wouldn't hear my bill. And part of it was the minority party at that particular time. So we did a little bit of fussing back and forth in the newspaper and on the radio and eventually they heard the bill and it passed. So the media has some media has a tremendous, <laughs> tremendous influence. I'm learning that too. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, did you notice any difference of treatment between the genders, men and women, like freshmen coming in? No, mm -hmm. not really. No, I, I was the only woman in my freshman class. Okay. So, it, it, truthfully. My experience is, I mean, I've been the only woman with a lot of men for the majority of my life, so I, I don't think about that much anymore. I mean, it's... We would like to think we didn't have to. I know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. Uh, was your office always... Oh, no. <laughs> my first office was about, um, I, I'd say about three foot wide and about five foot long. It wasn't a closet, but pretty close, but I did have a window. And I, and I do say that, that they gave me the the office with a window because I was female. Now, whether they did or not, I don't know. We were in what they call the fishbowl, which is a series of offices on the third floor on the uh, north side. And I think there's one window on the whole, in the whole suite of offices, and they put about 25 or 30 people in this real small area. So it was part of the freshman year, part of the experience. And then you moved again. How many times? Then you, you move every two years. Every two years. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's I, from what I've been told, it's like the fraternity or sorority house in college. That the older you are and the, or the the more seniority you have, you get to we pick offices purely by seniority. Okay. So, well, describe a typical day then for you. Um, what I tell the kids when they come up to talk to them, I you know I get up early. When we're in session, most of the day start. Work starts around seven because you generally meet with people before um, committees start at eight, and that gives you a chance to talk one on one with people. You have committees usually till noon. Um, traditionally, we go into session at one thirty and work until the bills are heard, and then there are receptions or dinners for people. You know, everyone wants to meet you and have access and feed you and feed you and feed you. And then after that, you go home and do your homework, which is, I, I read the bills. <laughs> Not everyone, I don't think, reads the bills, but you take home a huge stack of, of reading material to look over before the day starts day over. Day. And, you know, if I, I'm like 55 miles from here, if I drive home, it's a pretty short night. So generally, I stay in the city for in session. You had rent an apartment? Or we bought a, a duplex. Been interesting how people have handled that part. Yeah, it. I mean, I, I would drive if the hours were such that you could leave. And I, I said though there were a couple of nights I went home and my toothbrush was still wet the next <laughs> when it was time to get back in the car and come back back to the city. So. Well, in your first couple of years, how did you manage having a younger child? having a young guy at home? Uh, mm -hmm. Tremendous family help. My husband's hours were such that he could pick him up if I had to work late. And uh, I have nieces that are great sitters and grandparents and aunts and uncles. Every, everyone chipped in to make it work. And so he would be a senior this year? No, he's in the sixth grade. He was two when I ran. Was, okay. He was a little bitty. He's in the sixth grade right now. Mm -hmm. Fun years. Fun years. Oh, yeah, we're learning that homework is for real now. <laughs> I still haven't learned that. <laughs> It's been a challenge. I mean, I, if I can make it through the sixth grade for the second time, I'm going to be really excited. <laughs> well, do you have a, a mentor within the, the Senate or House? The House. Um, person that I relied on 
tremendously was Larry Ferguson. He was the minority leader when I was elected. Had a district, I think, somewhat similar to mine, at least with the rural influence and some of the metropolitan. Pretty good guide um, as far as deciding where you needed to be on issues. And a lot of good advice on how to work with people and you know, knew a lot of people was able to give you insight perhaps before you met with them to say that you may not know this, but you need to before you go in. So. Have you found yourself playing that role with freshmen? I have somebody? a son, particularly in the last two years with term limits, or last two sessions with term limits, tremendous turnover. We have huge freshman class, um, classes with very <laughs> unproportionate numbers of people coming in. And 40 something one year. I yeah. Yeah, I, I think, and I'll have to double check, I should have done that ahead of time. I think we have 71 people right now that have been here three years or less out of 101. So yes, you do. And, and a lot of times you're able to tell them, we've tried this before and this was the repercussion or, you know, this is already in place. You may not know that. I, I know last year um, a lot of bills were filed in situations where there didn't need to be bill, you know, that I heard this on the campaign trail, I have to take care of it when I get there, and really you don't. You just need to be able to research it, look into it, and perhaps it's already been taken care of. Well, has there been a bill that you've been really, really pleased to have seen go all the way through that you've authored or co-authored? I think, and I, I said I will always remember my second bill, okay. <laughs> um, which I like to call the safe haven bill, but it's also been called the abandoned baby bill. Okay. Um, Legislation came out of Texas to say that if you have a child you can't care for, give it to a medical provider and we will take care of it and not prosecute you, which I thought was a good piece of legislation and filed it here and had a tremendous amount of controversy the first year that it was on the floor, brought it back the second year and had it passed. But you know, during, during that time, a little girl put a baby in a book bag and threw the baby in the, the dumpster. and that I mean, I hate to say that that helped, but it, it brought to reality the fact that this does happen. It does happen. And it, you know, I, I came into office thinking that I only cared about the business issues. That was my background, and that's what I'd always lobbied for the, the most in, in private life. But you, when you have a child or when you come up here and you see the many, many things that impact children, your direction begins to change. So... <laughs> That was I was excited to have that have that pass and and it's worked. So, any disappointments? Um, wasn't my bill. I mean, I, I I've never had any bill that I particularly cared dearly about that hasn't become law. I've been very disappointed to see the gambling laws come into play in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. But that's you know that's a personal belief and. I think, again, the, I'm on the uh, Employment Assistance Board for the Office of Personnel Management, and you hear that they serve in a helping capacity for all state employees or a, as a psychologist or a social service, and you hear the, the tragic stories that are happening that we're not, that I think we will begin to see very quickly, but we've not really seen in the, in the few years that gambling has been in place, but the addiction and the cost and the, the destruction that that's going to create. There's a, there's the monetary side of it, but there's a very personal side as well. You were, you've been the first, you've made some of the first. I made history, yeah. <laughs> first, what? Let's see yeah. if we can see. I don't know. I may have missed some, so why don't you tell me first. I was the first speaker pro tem. First woman to serve as speaker pro tem. Yeah. And then... Minority group too. Uh huh. Was a minority first, group. First, uh -huh. first woman to do that. Probably. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> what was that Probably. Like? <laughs> what was that like? Um. An honor, I'm sure. It was very much an honor, and and you know a surprise that that my caucus and I mean it's you know it's a bipartisan vote, and to to know that you won, the confidence of of the entire house. You you work, in that capacity, you come out of your your party role and serve everyone. 
And you know, I, I think that's hard for your your own party to understand that you have to be fair for everyone until they're in that position and they see how it runs, that they you know they still think that you ought to give them preference. And I didn't always do that. So, <laughs> but but I, I mean, I think I think I've been able to cross party lines and have good relationships with everyone in the house. What committees are you a member of now? Or now chair, chair? Um, I'm chairing banking, um, okay. banking, economic development, and common use. You're back. Yeah. Uh-huh. And any other women on those? Uh-huh. And most of the committees now, they have a mixture? Or they have a mixture, yes. That's <laughs> they try. You know, they try. Do you have a particular political philosophy? Oh, I think I'm pretty conservative fiscally and probably pretty moderate with the social issues. <laughs> so. I'm not a, not a huge tax fan. I'm, I'm one of those that really favors letting people make the own deci- make their own decisions with their money rather than have government make all of them. But you know, on the other hand, I still see that there's very definitely a need for dollars to run government because there are services that we have to provide. Well, with, with you being one of 19 women, do you, do the, does the women cluster together or? The first year we were here, we would, and they, they told me ahead of time that they did, they did this, that, we would call for a women's caucus with no purpose in mind other than to make everybody nervous. And it did. <laughs> They're always trying to find out what we were doing or where we were going or what we were planning and really nothing other than to make them worry. But um, three years ago, I guess, we did start a women's caucus. But it's not, it, the idea is that you would come up with certain legislation that you really wanted to work on. But the issues that we've had are not gender-based. I mean, they're they're pretty universal, and you you don't want to exclude having everyone involved in it. When, like, when the, in the evenings when you do the receptions and you could, is it safe? Do you go in pairs or? No, I usually or? go by myself, and I'm I'm one of the I've not because my son is so is still so young. Mm-hmm. I've done the receptions and rarely do a dinner. If I if I do a dinner, it's maybe maybe one a week. But no, I, I mean, you're among friends, and most of the places that you go are very close to the capital. Um, good security support. If you leave your car here and come back late, the the guards take really good care of you and really watch out for you. But you know, there are some places I wouldn't go without someone else to to go with me. But a lot of times we go in just mass groups anyway. So, I wondered about that too. Uh, and do you or have you made close friends with any of the other women? Odelia Dank and I. I mean, she's she term limited out last mm-hmm. year, but she and I were good friends. A lot of similarities in our in our lives, and we still stay in close contact, which is good. Mm-hmm. Kathleen Wilcoxon and I um, share districts, and okay. so. We've done campaigning together, door knocking together. It totally confuses them. We have names that sound alike. We both have blonde hair, so they never know which one <laughs> they're actually talking to. And we, if we come up together, it's even more confusing. But, well, I've had several other women have said they lost weight while they were running and that they've gained it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that, you know, I've said the, the campaign diet's terrific. You lose weight, you get a great suntan. <laughs> but then you come up and you sit. And everyone wants to feed you. I mean, it's there's not much opportunity to exercise. So maybe it's a good thing we ran over two years. You get to to work it <laughs> off. But do you lunch in most of the time then? Either you lunch in, or you know, there'll be someone here that has a lunch. Or a lot of times I work through lunch because that's one of the few times that, and I, I know that's that probably is a gender thing that rather than network, we have a tendency to to concentrate on real work instead. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty universal. Well, if you were given women advice that were interested in going into politics, what would you what would you have to say to them? I'd be excited for them. Know how much work it is that it's... I mean, and I just know from a woman's perspective... You know, I said my favorite, my favorite quote is the one from Margaret Thatcher. If you want something talked about, elect a man. If you want something done, send women. And I, I think we do take it... We work on, if we commit to something, we're going to work on it and work on it really, really well. So be be willing to do that. And I think anyone that was interested would be. 
Know that it's it's a strain on your family. Know up front that it's very, very hard when you're gone so much and either be able to work out something where you're together when you're in session or have understanding family members at home. <laughs> but you know, that that's a strain. And and know that they're not going to back off just because you're a woman. I mean, the, the campaigns are probably going to be just as tough regardless. And the camp, campaign finance, is, you know, it's difficult that first year, is it? It's hard. I think I, had, I know it's really hard for women traditionally to raise money in the same capacity as a man. I, I think I had an advantage because I'd done so much fundraising for other campaigns. So I had a good list, and I was pretty well known with the donors. Um, and then I, I mean, and I, you know, I'd done state, I, I'd done fundraisers for statewide candidates, so they were willing to help as well. Um, for a woman running first time, I would say, particularly if you're from a rural district, you're going to have a hard time. No, you know, I, I'd say work on a very careful campaign budget, put together the bare, just the basics of what you wanted to do, and then ex, you know, expand it as you had money come in. But there were people that are willing to help too, and there, there are people willing to help all over the state, not just in your your own community. Well, when it's under- and volunteer money is wonderful. Volunteers are even oh, yeah. better because you can't. I mean, money is money can get direct mail out, but going door to door, having people show up, all the places you need to show up, you need you need lots of lots of people to help. Did you have an, an office, a campaign office then, or you just ran it out of your home? I ran it on my dining room, <laughs> which I think most people do. I have an, I have a, an, a garage apartment, at my, and that's turned into my office. My husband bought me a 55-gallon trash can and said, move it. <laughs> so I moved it. Shredder? And I have a shredder. <laughs> You'd be amazed at how much paperwork you accumulate. Well, it's getting there. When you're when you've served your twelve years, what do you, what do you anticipate doing next? I, I don't know. I you know you keep hoping that something wonderful with one of your causes would walk through the door and say, "Please come help us." So, or you know, it, it might be a good opportunity to sit back and just decide what I really want to do at this Any time. Any aspirations to run for senate? If we can't term limits, we can only serve. Oh, U.S. Yeah. Senate. Yeah. Or even if you switched for your twelve years were. No, because, see, I, I wouldn't have time to, to serve a full okay. full term. Statewide office is appealing in some ways. Um, Congress would be appealing if my family were at a point they could go with me. Mm-hmm. Or, or Congress or the Senate. But we'll just see what happens. So when you were initially considering running, it, it, the Senate for your district wasn't it open? It wasn't open. It was, it, you know, they're in off years. Mm-hmm. And... I, I just felt at the time I had more opportunities in the House than I would have in the Senate. Most people that are in the House prefer the House. Or it's, <laughs> it's more rough and t- I like the, <laughs> I, I've always thought the, the Senate was a little more serene and reserved, which I really like, than the rough and tumble in the House. But I think we really deal with the issues on a more of a gut level sometimes than I think they do. I, I, I mean, we really get into them more then I sometimes think the Senate doesn't. Maybe, you know, I've not been over there, so I don't really know what goes on in their committee meetings. Have there been any major obstacles? I really can't think of any that... That's not a good question. Most people have said no, so... I mean... So quit asking. (laughs) No, I mean, I... I think one of the, the challenges that we're going to have and I'm not going to be able to see that much of it, but I think others will. The term limits, with a, with a constant turnover, I think you're going to see a whole new direction in the house and your ability to get something done. Maybe it may become easier. It may become harder. I don't know. And you have the same assistant. No, I've time? had different assistants. I mean, she's been with me for four years, oh, and she's fine. wonderful. But before that, I've had. I said, is it me? But I don't think so. And I think there's just high turnover. And to be, until we, till I was old, well, till I had more um, time under my belt as a representative, you only have part-time help. You, know, you every, I think the outside world thinks that you have full staff. You know, we're like Texas. We have a home office that's fully staffed and a capital office it is. I said, 
for several years I had one half of a part-time secretary. So you do a lot of your own work, which is probably better anyway, because you know. In your own research. In your too. own research, yeah. Well, how do you decide to, uh, to do a bill? I to mean, do what, a bill? What is it? Um, my constituent points. Constituent has you know has has asked for things, and you always try to do those or something from your district. Um, and then some of the issues, I've worked. I've done a lot of work for the Fit Kids Coalition, or because they because I've done some children's things. I've had, DHS has asked me to carry several of their things. So okay. I think you begin to develop a a niche of where you, you know, where you fit where you're the most comfortable the research that you now have personally that makes it easier for you to present something. I do a lot of work for the state chamber. They laugh that I always call and say, okay, what are we gonna do this year? So a lot of, you know, they have a, a legislative agenda and always ask me to carry part of that, which has been fun because I enjoy that as well. And you did something in regards to vending machines? Oh, I did the vending machine, yes. I did the I'm the one that took the candy out of the vending with the snicker bars <laughs> and the cokes away from the little kids. <laughs> I say thank you. Uh, that was a good It's work. I mean, no one's, they, they really complained, and it really didn't go into effect until this fall, but people or the schools began to transition before It's just then. elementary school? Is it uh -huh. not high yeah, school? It's not high school. That's neat. <laughs> well, do you have that? What's so, I, I've laughed. I am was asked to be a board member of the Fit Kids Coalition or advisory board and prior to that they had given me given me a citizens award legislative award for having done that particular bill and I'd gone to this luncheon to get this and they had salad and then they had steamed carrots and steamed potatoes and steamed celery and boiled meat for lunch and then fruit for dessert and then they did exercises <laughs> and called to see if I would come to the next luncheon, which was the board meeting, and I said, she who eats Snicker bars for lunch is not interested in eating steamed celery ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that. But they're, they're very strong in their beliefs and carry it forward at every level. So. Okay, not too many kids will eat the steamed celery. No, <laughs> they won't. Well, then you had something to a part to play in the state aid, the formula of state aid that allowed libraries to do a little bit to get more um, increase the funding for them. So that was thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I have a real strong, real active um, librarian at the Mustang Library in my district, and she's you know, again presented the idea to Kathleen and I, and then helped us work on everything, which you know, really makes a difference. I, I told a group of people Tuesday, I said, we're not, we can't read minds, and until you come to us with problems, we don't always know they exist. And you know, we're more than willing to help you solve them, but we have to know that they're out there to begin with. Well, have you traveled much as a, as a legislator? Um, I've traveled some. We have a lot of opportunity, educational, opportunities. I, I got to go to, to uh, Puerto Rico this spring. A lot of trips to D.C., which, you know, I mean, you, f you fly in, you go to meetings, and you get back on an airplane and come home. So yeah. <laughs> as far as a lot of opportunities to vacation and see things, no, I haven't, but wonderful learning opportunities. And I, I've been very fortunate. I'm on the executive board for the Council of State Governments and for the Southern Legislative Conference, and particularly with the Southern Legislative Conference, it's 16 Southern states, and their issues are so similar to ours that you're getting ideas or seeing legislation that you can truly put to work. You know, a lot of times if you hear something from New York or California, it doesn't always work in Oklahoma. So, it, I mean, it, those, those have been real meaningful to me to pick up on other ideas and, and run with them. And to build a network, too. Uh -huh. You do. Things. You really do. Are there many women at those, too, or...? No. It's probably about the same. We're working on that. We're working. Oh, we're what, 11th from the bottom still? Something like that. Oh. Yeah, it's a little, little lower than that. And there was a, like a 20 year gap when there wasn't anyone either, so that's, that's changing too. And we finally sent someone back to Congress, which has been nice. Mm -hmm. Second time. <laughs> but, you know, the numbers in the Senate, all, of course, there's fewer people, but the numbers in the the state senate, anyway, have always been very, very small. 
unless there's you know a year I don't remember. But house numbers I think have increased, but not much. And then some have switched from the, the house to the Senate. To the Senate, yeah. You have. And you're kind of doing something with that. That's um, a breast and cervical cancer prevention treatment. So you're on that count floor, have been. I have been on, been it. on uh -huh. that. So you're active as well as doing, you know, yeah. here in this office. You're yeah. out, out in the community doing things too. And then you, uh, the Center for the Oklahoma School for the Deaf. Um, we're trying to. We're trying to locate a professional center on the campus at USAO. They train more teachers for the deaf than any other college west of the Mississippi. And we're trying to do a, a project in conjunction with the School for the Deaf at Sulphur where we do the education and have a daycare facility so that they, there's a lab school mm -hmm. in conjunction with, with the teaching opportunities. And, Hopefully we'll get that done this year. That's one we've worked on for two or three yeah. sessions. We have the, I got the money for the building, and now we need to get the money to expand the program. It's not a, a one-year thing. No, keep, you keep, keep working on it. And you're st you still have your the Winchester group? I still have the Winchester group, but not much time to do anything with it, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'll do when I turn one out is go back to doing that. Yeah. Your husband is the Supreme Court Justice. Uh -huh. Is there, you two have to work in tandem, I guess, to well, make sure. Governor Keating always introduced us as the person that made the laws and the person that threw them out. <laughs> so, but there's not really been much, com I think I've had two, there's been two cases that he recused himself from because I'd been involved with the legislation yes. out of several years so that's there's not much conflict and he could care less about what we do and vice versa so <laughs> he's just not much interested in mm -hmm. the process that goes on up here i had read something that your grandmother had a, a large a large yeah. influence on you do you yeah. want to talk a little bit about her um she was the maid of honor oh you're that i have i have the grandmother that had the most influence on me i, I lived with growing up and just a stellar model, I think, for all women. It had her first child when she was 16, ran a grocery store, did almost every, I mean, just, I, I'd always laugh. She drove a pickup when, you know, now it's no big deal, but when I was growing up, it was sometimes humiliating that you, you had a grandmother that drove a truck and wore a baseball cap, and then she always wore velvet house shoes with rhinestones on them and <laughs> painted her fingernails and went to the beauty shop each week. But did a lot of very non-traditional things that probably had a, and I know, had a huge influence on me and my perspective of being able to do anything you wanted to do. And she was the maid of honor at your wedding? That was my other grandmother. Yeah. Uh -huh. She was not. She was 90. When we got married, she was 90. 90. That's very neat, I think. She was, she was a neat lady. I too, well, very similar. I just didn't spend as much time with her. Um, Married when she was 28, had her first child at 30, and then 32, and then had two children in her 40s. Her husband died um, very, very early. Was left to raise the two, my two aunts, by herself. Taught school, raised them, sent them through through, through college. Um, just a, a total free spirit, and not in the sense of free spirit as you sometimes hear it now, but. She'd call and I'd say, where are you? I mean, you never know if she was in New Mexico or Chicago or Houston or, you know, traveled and did and just a great person and very confident with who she was and what she could accomplish. And was your mother similar? No, my oh. mother's not, no. <laughs> Skip the generation. Skip the generation, yeah. <laughs> okay, then if I need to add something I haven't covered. Anything that's unusual, that's unique? Nothing in politics we've done. Uh, can you can you tell that your life has changed some since being elected, other than just other than the chaos? The time, yes. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think you you're 
ability to work with people changes tremendously. I mean, that's what you're doing constantly, which I hadn't really, I mean, I'd worked with people, but not 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I think your ability to understand a lot of the, the common problems that are out there for everyone becomes more intense because you're, you're hearing those things every day. You realize that not everyone lives exactly like you do, that there are all kinds of situations. Sometimes you can help, sometimes you can't. It just broadens your, your whole philosophy of life. I've said if I could put together a doctoral program, I could never put together anything like this. I mean, it's been an awesome, awesome experience. You get to learn so much. Any time for fun? <laughs> you golf some, right? I golf some, yeah. And... Uh, my son's become a Boy Scout, so I'm I'm learning those things. Camping, right? Yeah. yeah, we went. And I I said in August, within well, one weekend we we uh, went on a canoe trip on the Illinois and camped out. I've never camped out in my life. It was a hundred and something degrees. <laughs> we came home, washed clothes, repacked, and we went to Colorado and did a class three rafting trip and took ATVs over the continental uh, continental divide. I said, now I want a trip for mom. <laughs> I want a spa treatment or a, just something soft and nice and being waited on. Were you a Girl Scout? No. <laughs> oh, heaven no. No. That's fun, too. That's a nice change of pace. Completely. It really is. Different. And it's, oh, it's fun to be with him and for him to know that I can do those things, too, if he wants me to. To build a fire. Oh, yeah, that's the only thing. They want knives and fires. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't have anything else, my last question is usually uh, when history is written about you, what would you like for it to say? I, I thought about that on the sheet. I, said, I think that if, if they could say that I made the difference in the life of a child, that that would be really meaningful to me. Well, I'm glad you have already done that. <laughs> my son that thinks that the world revolves around the capital, probably. Well, I'm, I, I'm anxious to see what he, he says. Is, is he going to do this when he grows up? Who knows? Some sons have. I yeah, mean, some have. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, Mason, I, I know, well, Tom, mm -hmm. and then Mason, I think, has political interest when he comes, you know, if, if there becomes an opportunity for him to be back here or wherever he is. Davis may be governor. Davis may be governor someday. <laughs> <laughs> I introduce him that way sometimes. That we have the the judicial branch and the legislative branch, and we're hoping for future executives here. Well, hey, back up a little bit. I'm interested in you being the woman pilot. There's not very many of those. Do you still get to fly? Uh, no, not really. Today? No, and I didn't. I mean, my my dad was a trainer in World War II, and. My first husband was a commercial pilot, and they didn't want someone with my total lack of experience <laughs> at the controls. I mean, I flew some, but I haven't in a long time. I learned it, I wish you. Yeah. Yep. That's good. You graduate from I graduated from, from flight school at OSU. Yeah, that's good. Well, uh, if there's nothing else, thank you very thank much. Thank you.